Welcome to the second class about goal condition reinforcement learning. In this lesson, we will see formal frameworks and we will see that there are several possible formal frameworks to represent goal condition reinforcement learning and also some of the core concepts. First of all, let's say that this lesson builds a lot on this paper from Cédric Collard and I encourage you to read it if you are really interested in goal condition reinforcement learning. So let's start again with the definition of the goal that I presented in the introduction from Elliot and Freer, which states that a goal is a cognitive representation of a future object that the organism is committed to approach. So if we want to formalize this notion of goal, first we need to emulate an organism. And the idea is that an RL agent is the perfect object to emulate this organism. If you consider the MDP framework, the RL agent is committed to approach future objects through the reward function by interacting with its environment. So we will build on the MDP framework with the state space, the action space, the transition function, the reward function, and eventually some discount factor. Okay. And the point that Cedric makes very clear is that the MDP defines what we call a task, which is the problem that an agent has to solve. But if we need to include this cognitive representation from the definition, we need to give the agent this cognitive representation, which will be a goal. And we will see how to do this on the next slide. Okay, so we want to undo the agent with a goal representation. The idea is very simple. The policy, instead of just being conditioned on a state and providing an action, will be conditioned on a state and a goal. And you can see that depending on the algorithm, you will add a goal either just to a policy, which will be called the actor in an actor critic case. Okay. If you have a critic only algorithm such as DQN, you will condition the neural network that you use with a state and a goal, and it will give you the Q value of doing an action in a state given some goal. And if you have an actor critic algorithm, you have to condition both the critic and the policy on the goal so as to determine what to do. The main advantage of doing this with neural networks is that will, it will provide you generalization over both the state space and the goal space. But you have generalization only if you have some local continuity between states and between goals. Uh, that's not always the case. For instance, if you take this maze example, we have two goals that, that are very close to each other, but the trajectory to reach them are completely different. So you should not generalize over those two close goals. Learning how to do this will not help you to learn how to do this. And we will see this with the question of transfer learning later on. Okay, now I told you that there are some different possible frameworks to represent um, goal condition reinforcement learning. So first, let's distinguish the case where the agent has to solve multiple tasks and the case where it wants to achieve different goals in the same task. Here you have a depiction of the multitask case where you have several MDPs and a single agent, eventually not conditioned on a goal, that wants to address those different MDPs. Okay, so in the multitask framework, the agent faces a set of MDPs. These MDPs can differ in any MDP component, can be a different state space, a different action space, a different transition function, etc. Okay. And the agent itself may have a representation of which MDP it faces, in which case it is easier because it has to learn a different policy for those different MDPs, or it does not have such a representation. And then we want the agent to behave as well as possible, uh, given some uh, average behavior over the different MDPs, which of course will not be very efficient. The other case is the goal condition uh, case, the multi-goal case. Okay, and let's consider first the case where the goal comes from the environment. So in that case, we will extend the MDP with some goal. So the MDP contains the state space, the goal space, the action space, etc., etc. And what is important is that the reward function will depend on the goal. So this function is dependent uh, on the goal that was chosen. And the idea is that this extended MDP, which contains a goal, provides both the goal and the reward function that the agent gets for solving the goal. Now let's see a different distinction, which is also very important. If we consider the multi-goal case, 
the goal can come either from the environment or from the agent itself. Okay, so in the Golanv uh, framework, okay, I named this from the name of Jim and then Gymnasium environment, which are called Golanv when they are a standard reinforcement learning environment, but with a goal. Okay, there is a special interface to uh, interact with environments which, which have a goal uh, in the Gymnasium library. So in this multi-goal case, the environment will provide the goal and the agent is rewarded for solving it. So you have some goal generator inside the environment and the reward function depends on the state and the goal. So these elements, the goal generator, etc., are all defined by the experimenter when they define the environment. Or it can be the reward in, in some cases. Okay. By contrast, in the auto uh, learning framework, where so where, when the agent sets its own goals, this time the goal generator is inside the agent and the agent will eventually reward itself from reaching its own goal given the current state. So in that case, what is very important is that the environment does not provide a reward. Okay, the reward comes from the agent itself. So uh, to define this case, we have several options again, and I will stick to this particular one where in fact, you will define in the environment a goal condition reward function, but actually this goal condition reward function will be seen as provided internally by the agent, but you have to decide how to set it in some way. Okay. So in this case, there is a single task, a single MDP, okay? and the goal is not provided by the environment, by, but by the agent. And the goal dependent reward function defines the corresponding reward. But often this is the experimenter that has to define this. But this is not always the case. For instance, in recent works with visual language models, you can use the consistency between some textually expressed goal and some images to define what's the reward function. So in that case, the reward is not defined by the experimenter, but learned through a neural network, for instance. And if the goal space is defined in advance, you can define intermediate frameworks where in the MDP, you have a state space, a goal space, and a goal condition reward function. So I wanted to stress that there are several possible frameworks to represent those different cases. Now let's speak a little more about goal spaces. Okay, you can have a goal which is just a point in a goal space. You want to have this uh, string through this needle, or it can be a member of a discrete set of goals, or it can even be a trajectory in some space. Okay, if you want to perform this particular trajectory, okay, here you have different goals, but you could also have a particular movement which will which would be a goal which is not reducible to a state. Another point is that the goal space can be given or learned. Okay, for instance, it can be the output space of a neural network or an embedding or these kind of things. And besides to determine which goal was achieved, you need to define a goal achievement function. I will note it this way. So this function, an uh, achievement function takes as input a trajectory that I note too, and it provides the goal that was achieved given this trajectory. So this function can be just a function of the current state. It is often the function just of the final state, or it can be a function of the full trajectory, which is of course more general. There are many, many works in which the goal space is just the state space. Okay, you want to reach a particular state. And in the case where the goal space is the state space, then the achievement function, it's just the other identity, but often you add some tolerance epsilon. So you will say that an agent has reached its goal if it's in a small ball around the state that it is targeting. And one has to be aware that defining a goal achievement function can be as hard as defining a reward function. So it's not a way to escape for the reward engineering problem, because for instance, if you want to determine whether uh, folding an object was achieved, you have to define a very complicated function to make sure that your trajectory um, succeeded in doing what you were willing to achieve. Another set of core concepts that are very important to get when you consider studying goal condition or reinforcement learning is the difference between desired behavioral and achieved goals. First, desired goals, we note them GD, 
are the goals we ultimately want, want to achieve. So for instance, if you have this maze and your agent starts from here, your desired goal could be that particular uh, goal here. Okay, so you want your trajectory to reach that particular goal. But it may not be feasible to learn a policy to reach uh, this goal immediately. So what you will do is that you will condition your policy on something which we call a behavioral goal. And your behavioral goal can be intermediate. First, you may want to reach this, and then to reach this, and then to reach this, etc., etc. Okay. And the idea is that you will want to expand your behavioral goals towards your desired goals. And finally, the third notion is the notion of the goal you achieved. And what is very important is that the goal you achieved is often not the, the goal with which you condition your policy. It will be the goal uh, with which you condition your policy if your policy is successful, but that's not always the case. Still, another distinction which is important to define goal condition reinforcement learning problems is whether you use a dense reward function or a sparse reward function. Here, I represent a dense reward function where the agent is rewarded for getting closer and closer to the goal. So a sparse reward function is generally a function that will output a 1 if the goal is achieved and a 0 otherwise, or eventually 0 if the goal is achieved and minus 1 otherwise, which favors exploration. And a dense reward function, by contrast, is generally a decreasing function of the distance between the state and the behavioral goal. And to define this distance, generally it's, it assumes that you will project either the states in the goal space or the goal in the state space so that you can measure a distance. I should say that in the research in autotelic agents often uses sparse rewards because they are simpler to define, okay, you reach the goal or not, and it's less prone to deceptive gradients. A deceptive gradient is a gradient that will let the agent learn something that you don't want it to learn uh, with respect to the goal you are willing to achieve. A side note to say that Goal condition reinforcement learning can be seen as trying to learn an identity mapping between the behavioral goal space and the achieved goal space. In fact, your desired goals could be represented as a distribution. Okay. If this distribution is uniform over the goal space, you can ignore it. What you want to do is to achieve any goal in the goal space. That's called the coverage objective. Another important point is that Behavioral goals can also be sampled from a distribution, but before the agent gets expert, the achieved goal is generally not the behavioral goal. So one perspective on goal condition reinforcement learning is that you want to learn uh, identity mapping between the behavioral and the achieved goal distribution as represented in this image. Finally, an important set of notions about learning successive goals. Uh, these notions are transfer learning, which can be positive or negative, and catastrophic forgetting. So first, let's consider this diagram that I took from this very famous survey about transfer learning. So consider that you are learning a task from scratch here, and then you try to learn this task by having learned a different task before. You can have just the same learning trajectory if there is no transfer at all. But if your learning trajectory is this way, it's called positive transfer because your performance is better thanks to the fact that you learned a different task before. And in, that, in the case of the red trajectory, that's called negative transfer because your performance is lower due to the fact that you uh, learned a different task before. And you have to consider that to, to measure the quality of transfer, you can consider different metrics. One is called jump start. Okay, it's how good am I after learning the first task and just trying the second task with respect to the case where I did not uh, learn the first task before. You also have time to threshold. So you set a threshold and you say that from training on the different task before, you reach that particular performance this time before what you would have obtained if you had not trained before. And you may also have a different asymptotic performance. It can happen that transfer learning makes you more expert finally on the task after convergence of training. So you have those different measures of transfer efficiency. Now to distinguish negative transfer from catastrophic forgetting, you have to consider this fact that negative transfer affects the performance 
on the next task. Okay, so you train on the first task and then you measure the performance on the next task and it's lower. By contrast, catastrophic forgetting affects the performance on the previous task. You are training on your new task and you are forgetting what you learned on the previous task. And you have to know that there is a field called continual learning or lifelong learning or continual lifelong learning which consists in leveraging positive transfer and mitigating catastrophic forgetting. And you have a very well-known survey of this domain here. And that's it for that lesson. Thank you for listening. Just showing the slides for the references.